Helio is the first U.S. company to be able to swarm fly drones over 55 pounds. So that means that one operator alone can operate up to three drones over 55 pounds without any additional staff present. What this all means is that finally, the regulation has caught up to the technical abilities of companies like Helio, because we've been able to swarm these drones of any size, technically speaking, since our inception. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 422. I'm just returning from a month in London, and then two weeks in Arizona, and I'm ready to talk about the drone industry. So that being said... Are farm fields across America about to see swarms of drones? For that question, we head to Richmond, Texas, to speak with Arthur Erickson, CEO and founder of Helio Drones. Helio develops and offers innovative drone systems that automate precision agricultural treatments. The company is America-owned and operated, and its drones are made in the USA with U.S. and globally sourced components. Using Helios technology, farmers and producers can now apply crop treatments directly to problem areas, allowing farmers to increase yields by addressing pests and deficiencies with more accuracy and efficiency. Earlier this year, Helio received the first ever FAA exemption for 55 plus pound drone swarms to fly over farmlands. Under the exemption, the company has been granted permission to swarm up to three 55-plus pound UAVs at a time, with one pilot and no visual observer. The drones will monitor crops using AI, they'll plant seeds and perform spray applications of fertilizer, pesticides, and more. This achievement sets an important precedent for the commercial UAS industry, and lays the groundwork for other operators to file and obtain the same permissions. Arthur received a degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. While working as a UAS researcher, he started Helio in 2015 alongside fellow students. Arthur has led Helio from the early days of prototyping through the present. Today, Helio's systems are owned and operated by hundreds of farmers and applicators in both the U.S. and abroad. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, Arthur talks about Helio, the FAA exemption for agricultural drone swarms, and how this will impact the drone industry. But before we hear from Arthur, I want to stress that your support is the heartbeat of my podcast. Every episode is crafted with you in mind, and your generous donations ensure I can keep delivering the content you love. Whether it's the price of a coffee or a more substantial contribution, every bit helps to defray the cost of production. Donate today and be a vital part of the podcast's continued journey to greatness. And for a limited time, donate $100 or more and receive an official Drone Radio Show coffee mug. To donate, go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. And if you can, please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and leave a nice review and rating on iTunes. It really helps improve the podcast ranking among the many thousands of active podcasts today. And by the way, if you have a great story about the use of drones that you'd like to share in a podcast, Contact me at randy at droneradioshow.com. So let's learn how Helio is using drone swarms in the agricultural sector with Arthur Erickson of Helio. Let's pick up the interview where I ask Arthur to introduce himself. My name is Arthur Erickson. I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of a company called Helio. Arthur, tell us about Helio. What does the company do? I started Helio back in 2015 when I was a student at University of Texas at Austin with some former fellow students, now co-founders of mine. 
And in a nutshell, what we do is we design, manufacture, and then sell crop protection drones, UAS, unmanned aerial systems that basically put out uh, liquid or solid agricultural inputs in precise and economic and safe ways. So basically, we're trying to replace a lot of the traditional methods for applying agrochemicals and seeds, such as tractors, airplanes, and helicopters, and do it in a way that's cheaper, autonomous, and just overall better. How old is the company? It started in 2015, so that would put us at just about nine years or so right now. How would you characterize the growth and the adoption of your products into the market? So we didn't actually start selling our drones until 2019. And so for the first few years there, what we actually did was we were operating as a service provider. So instead of actually trying to sell our drone systems and the software that goes with them, we were utilizing them to spray acres. So uh, we'd go up to farmers. And this was a lot of this was actually south of the border in Central America, not here in the States, predominantly. So we would just go up to the farmer, say, hey, would you accept $10 per acre? We go spray fertilizer or fungicide or whatever it is. And that's how we made money for the first three or so years of the company's existence. And it wasn't like a ton of money. uh, But the, the point was, you know, we were able to, to sustain ourselves and to learn. So we were getting that direct market experience by being essentially our own first customer, right? So we were out there spraying and every day we would get 40, 50, 100 acres, wherever it was. We kept trying to increase that number, increase our productivity. And that was a direct reflection of how well our products, our technology actually worked. So every time we had a hang up in the field, if software had a bug or hardware failed in some way, we would say, hey, that cost us you know, 100 acres today. We would go back that evening and we would do a little lessons learned debrief, say, how can we fix this? What are the biggest needle movers? We would improve the product. And then after three, three years of that, we finally got to um, 2019 or so, like I mentioned, where we said, hey, we feel good about this product. We're, we're actually now making money with it. We're productive enough to where we feel with a straight face that we can go pitch this and sell this to people and truly believe and convince them that they're also going to make money and be productive with these machines. So. That's a long way of saying that the adoption road for us or to get to our current business model was a fairly long process, uh, at least relatively speaking, for a startup. So we weren't actually selling the product that we sell today for half of the company's lifespan, essentially. But the whole time, we were definitely improving and creating the product in the first place. The agricultural sector has always presented a strong use case, but customers have had a lot of resistance. They seemed really wedded to their current operations and hard to convince that drones could provide value. Yeah, that's that's part of the reason why we we did the service model first was because we couldn't convince people at the time, to your point, to just invest 20, 30,000, whatever it was in in the drone unit itself because the industry was so new. It was a concept they had never heard of. So yeah, back then, about 10 years ago, it was very difficult, almost impossible to sell a drone to somebody. But now, by contrast, the word's already out. So Fortunately, like for for me, our company, my my sales team, the conversation now isn't, oh, you know, here's what a drone is, period, and here's how it operates and what benefits it offers. It's you know, how does the Helio drone stack up against the competition and stuff. So most of the customer base, thankfully, is already bought into the idea and they're they're being more discerning about, you know, what do you offer that the other people don't, so on and so forth. Recently, swarming drones in agriculture have been gaining momentum and seem to offer benefits. Before we talk about the technology, can you tell us what is a swarming drone? The FAA defines swarming UAS to mean that a single operator is at the helm or directly controlling more than one UAS at a time, right? And that's on a fundamental level what it is. So for the longest time, what's been going on in the industry, drone-wide industry, but it's, it's really poignant in the ag industry because of the weights involved in the UAS. But what what the FAA had done was they allowed drones under 55 pounds to swarm. And so again, that, that means one person could operate multiple drones by themselves without needing a, a visual observer or other pilots present. And that was up to three drones under 55 pounds. And that was the longstanding rule for a while. But very quickly, agricultural drones far exceeded 55 pounds. So that rule was put into place when just the very first agricultural drones hit the scene, which was 
the DJI MG1P, which had like a two gallon payload. And we had a early drone called the, well, we still sell it called the Helio 210, which has a roughly two gallon payload as well. And those are just under 55 pounds. And they're good, but they're meant for precise work, like spot spray treatments and stuff like that. They're not actually meant for broad acreage. Basically, all the drones, the most popular drones today in the ag space are in excess of two to 300 pounds. So that swarm approval for under 55 pounds really wasn't helping a lot of the, the key operators and manufacturers in the space today, including Helio. And so we, as an industry, have been really bothering the FAA or, or petitioning them to allow for drones beyond 55 pounds to also be swarmable. And finally, as of February 26th, we had put in an application six to eight months ago, previous, and a month ago got approved, meaning that Helio is the first US company to be able to swarm fly drones over 55 pounds. So just one more time to reiterate, I know it's repetitive at this point, but that means that one operator alone can operate up to three drones over 55 pounds without any additional staff present. So to make this even clearer, it used to be that if you had three drones over 55 pounds, you would literally need two people present by the FAA's law for each drone, meaning you would have to have six people in the field, an individual pilot for each drone and a visual observer to accompany that pilot. So six people total for three drones, which is the complete opposite of what you... like. The benefit of this technology is that it's autonomous and you're supposed to force multiply a single operator who can manage an army of robots, right? So what this all means is that finally, the regulation has caught up to the technical abilities of companies like Helio, because we've been able to swarm these drones of any size, technically speaking, since our inception, practically, since back in 2016, 2017, when our first iteration of our software was released. So it's it's been a long time coming on the legal side. It makes all the sense of the world, of course, to, to swarm these drones. It just hadn't caught up yet in terms of legislation. Does the certification mean that Helio as a company has to fly the drones? Or are the drones certified so that you could sell them to an operator and they could fly the drones in a swarming configuration themselves? Yeah, that's an important distinction. So I'm glad you brought it up. This is going to be a little dry, but basically it's what you first said, which is that this permission is just for Helio. But the way the FAA does this, and they've done this with previous exemptions that they've granted as well, is that they always give one company the exemption to start with, which just serves as a precedent. And then you can essentially copy paste that for any operator or any other company, as long as they meet the technical or operational requirements like set forth in the original exemption. So what that means is they're going to file something called a summary grant, and this is all just minutia, but the summary grant uh, makes this into like a cookbook recipe, what Helio has, makes it more scalable. And then you can cite that summary grant and say, hey, because our drones are either directly, like literally the same drones Helio uses, they are Helio drones, or they're competitor drones that can do the same things as Helio drones, functionally speaking. If we can do that, if we can meet those requirements, therefore, we should have the same permissions that you granted to Helio. So that's just how the system works. It, it goes to an individual company first, that's just how they have their, their process flow set up at the FAA, but it is intended to go nationwide to everybody. What are the technology and safety innovations that you had to consider in getting swarming drones approved? Yeah, a lot of it is actually written literally into the the application and the subsequent exemption that we got from the FAA. But it's being able to prove to the FAA that there are robust enough and enough systems to have these drones essentially behave themselves, for lack of a better phrase, even though a operator isn't able to directly control them or monitor them every second of the operation. Because the FAA is admitting, okay, you have one operator commanding three drones, this operator is going to have to split their mental time and their literal observational abilities between three drones. So at most, each drone is getting 33% of your attention on average. So for the majority of the time, the other 66%, the drone needs to be trusted to do what it's going to do safely. So that's on the hardware side, that's redundant power systems, redundant GPS, redundant IMUs, redundant radar sensors, everything you imagine physically that would allow this drone to navigate its surroundings without crashing into stuff or suddenly dropping into the ground or flying too high for the given mission. And then on the software side, it's autonomous fail-safe. So if the drone notices that it's 
losing GPS signal, which could risk it flying erratically, it will, instead of just deciding to fly erratically and, and letting the, the error take it where it will, it'll land automatically right in place. Or if it notices some sort of object and it can't get around it, it'll land in place. And this is all like assuming that the operator isn't able to directly talk to it or communicate or command the drone because something else is happening. There's two other drones to look after or the the operator is some, somehow incapacitated, right? So we have to show that there's all these autonomous fail safes built in the software to guide the drone into safe procedures, if, if anything, if the pilot wasn't able to intervene themselves. There's other nitpicky stuff like, okay, um, in our software, we have to have a button. We didn't have this previously, but but we have to have a method for landing all the drones all at once, right? A single button that you can press that can be like, every single drone flying right now needs to go straight down and that's it. That's just like something that makes the entire process easier to navigate for a single operator. How do you see swarming drones impacting farming operations? Yeah, luckily this is one of those things where the math is pretty easy. You know, one drone can do, let's say our AG230 model, one of our more popular models can do about 50 acres per hour depending on the dosage, it's up to 50. Now with three of them, it's not perfectly linear. Let's say there's some operational drag, but you might be able to do 130 acres per hour by deploying three of these at a time, right? Not 150, because that would be in a perfect world, but maybe 130, 140. So you're, you're seeing some very significant productivity boosts, which the big takeaway is there's already a lot of people convinced that drones are great. They have done side-by-side -side comparisons, not just Helio, but other companies in the industry. They have really good deposition efficacy of spray because of just the, the way physically they're set up. They're able to push this spray down into the crop and get good penetration and whatnot. So they're, they're great tools. People have always been held back, some people mentally, by the idea that they're so small and that comparatively speaking, compared to a helicopter or a big self-propelled ground rig John Deere case sprayer, for example, they're relatively slow in terms of acres you can put out per day. So what this finally unlocks is if you have a sufficient amount of drones, three, four, five, whatever it is, you know, multiple swarms, uh, even just three big drones, you can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe and do one to 200 acres per hour, which is what a lot of these traditional large pieces of equipment are doing. So now... There's no longer that argument that drones are great, but they're just slow. And I don't know if I can hit the scale I need to, to, to fit into my timetables or my, my top line production goals for the, for the season. So it's, it's that kind of step change or unlock in the industry where finally traditional players can't make that argument against the drones anymore. You mentioned that an operator has to divide their attention among multiple drones, up to three. Does it require any new training for someone to monitor three at a time? The FAA hasn't introduced any sort of new training requirements for the for the pilot certification as far as I've seen. I wouldn't be surprised if they do. There are guidelines that they have outlined that they've had before. You know how I was talking about how the under 55 pound drones were already legal to swarm, but there's nothing new that I've seen yet because of this specific exemption. There might be in the future, but that's already out there. What's the best way to deploy the drones? Do they go to three separate areas of a field? Or do they work together in tandem? You put them out far enough away from each other to where you're deconflicting the airspace. You'd want to almost keep each drone on a separate lot if the geography is laid out in such a way to do that in front of you. But if you have a big enough lot, quarter section or, or larger in front of you, then yeah, you can just make sure they're spaced out within that section in a safe way. Was there anything special or unique about getting the exemption? Or was it fairly... I don't want to say routine, but exemptions happen quite frequently. So any surprises during your process? Yeah, I would say fairly routine. What's surprising is the fact that they just decided to do it. So we've gotten a ton of exemptions. We, we help all of our customers go through the, the FAA's 137, 44807 processes, which aren't exactly super straightforward, but for, for us, they are because we've done it so much. And we've gotten other exemptions that are less exciting, that are quote unquote precedent setting, right? Like reducing, for example, reducing the the distance that the drones are required to have from a public road, for example, that used to be 500 feet, but we, we asked for permission for that to be 100 feet. And that's a lot less sexy than saying, oh, now we can swarm drones. But that's just an example of something we accomplished in the past. But yeah, it was the same process where you have this relationship with the FAA because you've already worked with them to get 
X number of exemptions already. So you kind of know what they like in terms of what they think de-risks something enough to justify them putting their stamp on it, allowing it to happen. So Helio has that knowledge base. We we've iterated with the FAA. We we know like what's pushing the line, what's safe in their eyes, etc. So it, it was just a combination of that, luck, timing. The FAA seems like they've been wanting to be more open with, with regulations for the US drone industry because they want us to be competitive economically with these other countries. So that's definitely like what they say in the presentations and in the communication we hear from them. And so it was just a matter of time, which was frustrating to us and to a lot of people, but they had to give it to somebody. So it we got lucky in that sense. We put our application in. Some other applications were in there as well. There was differences between them. And I think because, like I mentioned, we had that experience of of understanding the technical things the FAA is looking for, I think our application was just a little bit stronger in that sense. In the larger scheme of things, what do you think this certification means for drone use? Yeah, I think this is a taste of the FAA allowing these drones to to finally live up to the moniker drone, right? With the exception of the under 55 pound drones, they had treated drones still as directly piloted aircraft, just the pilot happened to not be physically in the machine, right? And that was the philosophy, or at least that's how it appeared to us in the industry, the FAA was viewing these things. But this is a marked shift in their in their mentality in that way. And it's cool because we talked about it earlier yeah they're they're actually trusting the manufacturer when we say hey our drones are capable of looking after themselves for these tasks throughout the mission and what that leads to is okay now the AFA might say one day if you sufficiently prove it there doesn't have to be a human involved in the operation at all so we're looking at not just one pilot being out there with three drones but we're looking at just a station that the drones land at and refuel at and refill payload at automatically, which is maybe just remotely monitored or even just monitored by sensors in terms of oversight, right? Instead of having a physical person present on the operation. So that's a long ways away, I think, from a regulatory perspective, but this is definitely a philosophical shift in the FAA's approach, which is a good omen for that coming down the pipe. Can you operate at night? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, another little tidbit in there, which I think is powerful. Not a lot of people realize it, but sometimes, well, people in the in the application industry would know that sometimes the best time to apply, uh, thanks to environmental conditions at night, is is at night, right? There's typically less wind, there's less heat, so it might not invert a sensitive product as much. Yeah, so night flying is important from that sense for for really s- squeezing out some optimal gains out of your applications. It's not as dramatic as as the swarm exemption, but it was thrown in there. And that's the FAA has a tendency to do that as well. From what I've seen, what we've seen, the FAA doesn't like to just approve one thing because just to get the gears rolling in a government institution like that, you kind of want to make it worth it, right? So they like to throw in two, three, four things per precedent setting exemption. So then these can all be individually cited for future customers or operators that want to access them. Are there any special measures that you have to take? Yeah, there is visibility specifications. It's, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. I think it's like three statute miles or something that the drones LEDs have to be visible from. And you have to follow the typical FAA LED color configuration, which is white in the back, red in the left, green on the right, I think. I could be messing that up, but generally speaking, that's that's kind of how it is. So yeah, there's there's some stuff like that, nuts and bolts differences you have to do. And I don't believe it's for all of night either. I think that I would have to double check. I'm not the FAA expert by any means at Helio, but I, I think it's only some hours of the night as well. It's not like middle of the night, as far as I know. I think it's like twilight stuff, but I'd have to double check that. How do you characterize the demand for drones by the agricultural industry today? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's sky high. Uh, it's it's actually kind of a problem. It's a, it's one of those, what they call good problem, right? Because we have people ordering every day and we are growing fast and you know, we've, we've doubled the size of our production team just in the last year and we're trying to push more drones out the door, but it is just becoming a thing that everybody wants. So we're seeing the, the benefits of that. There are several foreign made drones, right? That are, that are resold here through distributors and whatnot. They're getting a lot of orders as well. So Drones have gone from, 
I think you could say that there was only like 500 spray drones in the States before 2020. There's probably at least four or 5,000 now. And I could see that doubling year over year for the next you know, eight, nine, 10 years or so. Where do you manufacture your drones? We do that down at our headquarters in Richmond, Texas. So that's just south of Houston, about 25 minutes south. Uh, We've got 35,000 square foot facility. We're actually expanding it now, putting down a new building. So like I said earlier, trying to really increase our output, but that's where it all happens. Is there anything that we missed that we should talk about? As far as like the topic of this conversation goes, FAA exemptions, this swarm thing is just the start. We touched on it. I think there's going to be more and more autonomy eventually take the human completely out of the equation. But there's also exciting stuff like beyond visual line of sight permissions that we're trying to get as well. So you could see, at least in huge tracts of farmland where they're relatively depopulated, you might be able to fly your drone miles and miles out to different work sites instead of just having to drive it around, shuttle it around, right? So there's exciting stuff like that being worked on. And, you know, most of the people only hear about it once the FAA actually passes it. But but rest assured that companies like Helio are, are fighting to expand the rights of these operators. What's next for Helio? There are some new products. We're launching a Scout drone, a sensor-based drone, which is uh, traditionally not something that we focused on. We've been focusing on the heavier application drones that actually carry payload. But we are going to release a... It's similar to like the crop scouting drones that you see on the market today. Uh, in form factor, function, and whatnot, but we just make it in-house and it's going to integrate really well with our software stack. So we've got that coming out. We've got a new controller solution coming out, which we call the Ground Link. So that's basically a Windows tablet with a with joysticks built into it. So it's it's both your fully functioning work station where you can even run Excel or run our software on it, uh, but also it's got joysticks if you need to manually control the drone. So those are two new exciting products that we're launching this year and a few more coming next year, but I don't want to reveal those just yet. And for my final question, Arthur, what message would you like to leave regarding the future of the drone industry? I think the future of the drone industry is bright. I've always urged this, even though the regulations right now may seem daunting, or if you have doubts about just the efficacy because it's so new, I want to tell people that this isn't just a fad. It's not a scam. I know a lot of times things are, but as someone that lives and breathes this every day, just trust me, the benefits are there. I'm not saying drones are the silver bullet and literally solve every single agricultural problem. But if you've been on the fence about getting involved in the industry, maybe buying a drone or at least just getting some drones to service your farm, I'd recommend you do it and seeing is believing. So I very much believe that once people experience the drones, it all clicks, so to speak, falls into place. And, and then the sky's the limit from there. That's it for episode 422 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Arthur Erickson of Helio Drones. I want to thank Arthur for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Helio or want to connect with Arthur, check out the webpage at hyl.io. If you like the Drone Radio Show, then please subscribe and share write a glowing review on iTunes. And if you're able, donate to keep the podcast going. Go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. And thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me. And I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Goers. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.